got my book, so I'm not going to bother to introduce, share with you my background, primarily out of industry, though, as you'll see. Uh, and one of the things that got me into this was something that happened, it happened twice in my career, but I, I left SC Johnson and I went to McLadry. And I became a COO, after having been a CFO, VP of Finance at SC Johnson, I became a COO at McLadry, changed industries, changed companies. Moved to a new city. I moved from Chicago to Minneapolis. Sold our house in Chicago, or up in Racine, I should say. Anyway, I show up on the first day. Managing partner, who's my boss, says, I'm not there five minutes. And he says, did I tell you I'm going on sabbatical starting next Monday for two months? I said, no, I'd remember that. That, that I'd remember. <laughs> and he says, I said, so who do I report to in the interim? Who's going to be my guide? through this organization, through this industry. He said, well, you're the COO. You will know how to do this. And it's a good training exercise. So I was thrown into the deep end suddenly on how to navigate a new organization, a new industry. It happened, this was the second time it happened to me. It happened to me in France when I moved there. And six weeks into the assignment, my boss quit. Came in one day and said, I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> I didn't know the language, I didn't know the culture, I didn't know a soul in France. I have really bad luck, I guess, this way with transitions. But I mean, it, it, it taught me uh, how to navigate different cultures. And that's what really led me on this journey of this book, which, as uh, Peter said, is the second one I wrote. Get this to work. Yeah. And I went out, because there's a statistic out there. 40 to 50% of CEOs fail in the first 18 months in the job. And you think, oh, that's just been going on recently. Don't be discouraged. And Brett and I were talking about this today. Well, he's going to fail in 10 months. He's, he's an overachiever. No, he's going to be one of the successful ones. 40 to 50% fail in the first 18 months, and it's been going on for 20 years. So it's not a new phenomenon. But when you ask people, why is that happening? Eh, you get a bunch of different answers. So I said, well, I, I started a new firm called Value Drivers uh, right after I met with you guys. I started that firm. And I said, I'm going to be underutilized for the next year, probably, as I build this firm. So I'm going to go out and interview 30 CEOs, find out what did they do to be successful? What did they avoid or minimize along the way? And how did they succeed in today's environment? And how did they figure out what lies ahead and, again, successfully get around it? I had some ideas about it but they had actually done it. So that's what the book's about. As we'll see, there are nine behaviors we identified, 26 attributes of a successful leader, and uh, that's what we talked about in the book. Some of you complete the self-assessment, about half of you, and we'll talk about that as well. Fred asked me this today. He said, what's the biggest thing you find? What's the big problem that leaders have? It's arrogance. I can't tell you how many of them we run into that say, I don't need you, what you're selling. I'm the CEO. I'm the CIO. I know this stuff. That's why I'm in the seat I'm in. I'm the managing partner. That's the biggest problem, is their arrogance. Self-awareness and arrogance. And that is the tug of war that they struggle with. And that, I would argue, is why so many of them fail. Among the people I interviewed, was the former head of operations for Strategic Air Command. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting conversation because I met him literally going down in an elevator at a, a business club here. I just was on the elevator and someone said, have a good afternoon, General. Of course, I must have been in the military. Yeah, I was a two-star general in the Air Force. I said, gee, I happened to work for a three-star general early in my career. Do you happen to know, you know, Don Johnson? He said, well, funny thing. Don Johnson ran the nuclear arsenal. He was responsible for the nuclear arsenal in the country. And he said, funny thing, I reported to Don because I was responsible for the B-52s that fly the nuclear arsenal all around. So it was an interesting conversation I had with John Borling. Uh, and he had a very great comment about arrogance. And this is exactly what he said. It's a virulent virus. It can take you down in one unthoughtful assignation, it can take you down in one speech, it can take you down in one assignment of resources based on personal gain. It can take you down in so many ways. 
Sorry, Lee, I just walked in. I had dinner with him. Last oh, yeah? Week. Yeah. Well, he's in Rockford. He's Rockford, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, he's in the book many times because John was a great uh, person that I interviewed really for it. Uh, terrific. I mean, he, he's a John McCain. He was, in, he was shot down over Vietnam uh, as a fighter pilot in the Hanoi Hilton for six years with John McCain for a number of those years. Uh, fascinating story. But he took an hour and a half to talk to me, and he's woven in throughout the book. But that was one of the big things I got from those. Arrogance is, can be such a killer um, for successful people. Okay, so thinking about it. Think back to when you joined a new firm, took a new job. You know, what were some of the challenges you faced? What were the challenges you faced when you came into a new job? I've got my own list since you guys are still asleep. How about a lot of got us haven't boss. changed jobs? What's that's that? Part of our, a lot of us haven't changed jobs. Well, you, maybe you can remember back though when you started in that job. Michael has. Uh, or you changed, <laughs> changed offices. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like every assignment that you have, it's a new job, right? Yeah, in a way, every matter is a different different mm -hmm. job. Well, you get a new boss, right? Yeah. You're in a new job new challenges strategically, new expectations of you, of the group you're leading. You have a whole new group of direct reports, new services maybe that you have to master, new markets you're certainly selling them into, and new processes. Maybe it's a time and billing system. Maybe, who knows what it is? But if you come into a new position, it's new processes. It's going to be a change to, to what you define as the status quo. And the biggest one we found was it's a new culture. You're going to deal with a different, even if you just change offices within a company, move from Chicago to New York, it's a very different culture. Move from, like I did, Racine, Wisconsin to Paris, France. <laughs> Same similar. company. Very similar. Same <laughs> company. You know? No, yeah, there, there was nothing in common there. But when I, when I uh, one of the things, when I looked at switching jobs, and I was interviewed with one of the major, major you know, big law firms, they said, we need more laterals because they had so many homegrowns, they wanted new ideas. I mean, it was, because I, I mean, they were really adamant about it. They were just like, no, you don't get it. We want, you know, we're, we're, we're actively trying to get the new generations or people with yeah. other thoughts that have been other places. That's how I joined McGladry. I wasn't a CPA. I'd been on the other side for so many years, but they said exactly that, Michael. They wanted fresh thinking from the client perspective, and they weren't afraid to bring it in. That's so critical. But those, you know, different items I just listed, those all define behaviors that can derail a leader's career. And we're finding it, it, it doesn't matter if you're a leader or a new hire. This applies up and down the organization. So I want to take you through what the nine behaviors are. There are more detail in the book. There's more stories in the book. These are the nine. I'll go through each of them, so I'm not going to read them off. The most important one we found was ignoring the culture. You know, another Peter Drucker quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, culture becomes so important. I was talking to five CEOs of dot-com companies, very young companies, uh, maybe two, three years since they started. And they all talked about culture being so important. Now, they might define it differently than I do. One of them actually said, I said, well, how do you define it so your new people know what it means? We all empty the dishwasher, is what they said. You know, there isn't some hierarchy here that the owner or founder isn't, you know, too good to empty the dishwasher. We all do things for the good of the company. But culture becomes such a key factor. And I'll give you two stories. I interviewed a CEO here in Chicago, largest manufacturer within the city limits of Chicago, Kyle Seymour with SNC Electric. And he had been on the board of SNC for two to three years when he became CEO. And he said, I thought I knew everything about the company. I've been here three years as a board member, after Christmas parties, 
you know, at the good times, the bad times. I've been here for three years, so I know. She takes over as CEO. And at Christmas, he takes the week off. Big mistake. There was an unwritten rule of the culture that the prior CEO vigorously enforced that you do not take time off after a paid holiday. I'm not saying it makes sense, <laughs> but you know, the damage control Kyle said he had to go through because he violated this unwritten rule was enormous. And it taught a, a lesson in you know, something uh, my wife was recently interviewing for a new job as a paralegal. And she said, what should I ask the, the general counsel? I said, well, you want to know about the culture? Well, yeah, yeah, I'll ask him what the culture is. I said, no, that's an OK question, but you're not going to get a great answer. Ask the GC, what's not tolerated here? What behaviors are not tolerated here? And I think it's a lot easier for people to tell you what is a violation of a culture than what the culture is. Because if you ask what it is, you hear, we're collegial, we, we're ethical, we're, you know, we believe in integrity. But if you ask them what's not tolerated here, you're going to start to hear, you don't take vacation after a paid holiday. <laughs> the other stuff you can read about. It's the unwritten rules. And Kyle ran into that. The other one about, yeah. Quick comment. I had a client in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and he kept going, I've offered now triple pay when the Packers play for people to come in and work. <laughs> and he goes, you Packer fans don't, still won't show up. I said, give it up. I said, you can pay them, you can pay them five times. They're I not that was for honey. Well, those were the two days. It was like the opening of deer season and, um, and Packers. And he just, he just, I said, look, there's nothing you can do. There's no incentive comp you're going to do that's going to make, make this work. I had the same, when I worked at C. Johnson, I worked in the family office for a number of years. And we had to put on our calendar when grouse season was, <laughs> when bow season was, because Sam Johnson was going out hunting and there was going to be nothing transacted in the family office during hunting season. Uh, the other story, uh, my partner, uh, not in the book, but in a workshop we're now doing based on the book, was a Major League Baseball coach for 13 years. He coached with the Indians. We were talking earlier about that. He coached with uh, the Tigers, and he went to the World Series with the Anaheim Angels. He's actually got three World Series rings, because he went with, to the World Series twice with the Indians. Didn't win, or win at all. But uh, his name's Trent Clark, and Trent was telling me this story about at, at uh, Cleveland, they had just hired a free agent who came from the Yankees, and they were paying him some huge amount of money. I don't remember the exact amount, but huge, say $10 million. He comes in the first day to the locker room to the Indians wearing his Yankees hat. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and Trent said, What the hell do you think you're doing? He said, Well, what do you mean? You know, someone just paid you $10 million. If I've got Yankee, if I've got Indians underwear, I'd be wearing that today. And the guy didn't see this as, you know, a problem. You know, but it's, a, it's an example of how you can get off to a wrong start with a culture with something that you think is just, you know, you're not paying attention to. And it gets much more serious than that when you look at culture uh, within companies or organizations. So paying attention to the culture. That was number one. Well, I should say, what are the implications for you if you're, if you're a new leader? You want to drive from a deep and genuine respect for what the organization has accomplished, which is the Yankees story. Think about the impact first that you want to make, and then think about how you're going to prioritize it and pace it, and the change that you want to drive. And I got ahead of myself. So let the, the sources of organization pride determine how you pace your, your change agenda. But you're, you were brought in for change. But those are the three implications of culture for you. Do not ignore it. Do not go in there, my advice to you. The problem here is we've got to change the culture. <laughs> that, that rarely works. The next one on the list. Coming in with the answer. Have you ever done this? You're coming to a new organization. You do it this way. You know, I've been watching, and you, you're, you know, organize, you know, you guys do it this way. You feel like this picture on the left. A little bit of, gee, I didn't know I was doing anything wrong. And then it gets worse because you say, and we did it that way. 
that creates such a barrier between you know, the new employees or your, your new group and yourself when you talk in terms of you and we. And we heard this language repeatedly from some of the leaders that ran into it. So my advice is if you can avoid it, do that. So it leads to you know, a great question when you come in. Did you have a question? I did have a question. Uh, my question is, do you find this um, we, you, generational as well? You know, I haven't done enough research. That's a really good question. I don't know. I only, I'm a, well, the, the people I talked to were all ages. There were no millennials. We're starting to talk to millennials, but they were all mid-30s and older up to John Borling, who's probably close to 75, 80 now. So I don't know the answer. That's a really good one. It's prevalent among the group I talked about. They all recognized it. Uh, you and we. And you, you, you got to avoid that language. But there is a question that really, you know, everyone in the room needs to learn, every CEO, new leader needs to learn, new employee needs to learn. And that is, what do you think? Have the courage to ask people, what do you think? The biggest obstacle we face to doing client loyalty assessments, which we talked about last year, most people in professional service firms don't want to ask this question. There's really not a good reason not to, but what you'll get, how you break that barrier down between you and the people you're working with, and it's not just your, your employees or your staff. What about customers, clients, suppliers? They're a great source of information. You just have to learn those four words to avoid coming in with the answer. That's the bottom line. The, the third one's a big problem that we'll see. Everyone runs into this, holding on to underperformers too long. And there's a lot of good reasons why we do it. Ah, Fred's been here a really long time. Fred was a great rainmaker five years ago. You know, Sally, her clients love her. Yeah, but she's not so great with the staff. The staff actually hate her. Uh, you know, but we, we rationalize why we want to hold on to people too long. And what we did, we identified three kinds of, actually four kinds of performers in the organization. The true underperformer. Doesn't matter what you do, they're going to be an underperformer. They just don't have the skill set to move from Excel to SAP let's say. They aren't going to make that leap. They don't expect them to. They can't do it. That's the true underperformer. One of the, uh, Dan Tressler, I don't know if any of you know him with Tressler Law Firm in Chicago. they got about 100 attorneys. Anyway, Dan said, yeah, the problem with underperformers is you know, you wanna, you, you'll want you cut their pay. Because my experience is when you cut the pay of an underperformer, you get a lower paid underperformer. <laughs> you don't fix the problem. Because then the, the, the dialogue becomes, well, you're paying me less, so you're going to get less. You're already doing less than was desired. So underperformers, you got to get rid of, and you have ways to identify and do that. And I'm not suggesting, you know, just, you know, you got to go through processes and procedures to get people out of the organization. But when you have these people, they got to go. So underperformers are number one. The other is what we call the covert change killer. Yeah, Dan. Um, we, so, uh, I, I think there may well be a tension between your very first point about respecting the culture uh -huh. and this point that you're making now. They're both really valid points, but the hard thing is when those two points are in opposition. Have anything to say about that? Universally, the people I've talked to, my own experience, maybe you got to get the people out. They take down the rest of the organization. They actually are hurting your culture because you're tolerating the underperformance or some under behaviors that we're, other behaviors we're going to see, uh, they take down the morale. They take down the performance of the overall team. I, you just don't want to. I, I talked to one guy. I won't mention his name, uh, but you would know the company. He, it was when they first started out. He came in one day and literally fired all 11 people in the company. They're now a huge multinational. Fired all 11. I said, Why'd you fire all 11? Well, they weren't dressing well. They didn't have. They didn't use good language. I said, "Yeah, but you hired them all. It's as much an indictment about you as it is about them. Did you give them a chance to improve? No. And I did this in Canada. Maybe they can do it. 
I don't recommend that. That's a great one where you say, you just destroyed the culture. Who are you going to get to work for you? But he rebuilt the company and went on. But uh, our, yeah, there's some tension there, but that's good. She just don't want to be firing all 11 people at once. But you can't hold on to them too long. The covert change killer. That's the second one. That's the person that you're walking down the hall and they say, Andy, you're the greatest person in the world. If I were stranded on a desert island, you're the guy I want to be stranded on it with. I don't want to be there, though. <laughs> but then they go behind closed doors and they start telling Laura, that Andy, he is such a jerk. And they start tearing you down every chance they get. And it's that covert change killer that you got to get out. And they're, they're easy, I found them easy to spot. They probably have higher turnover in their group than everyone else. They probably don't accept, you know, they place blame on others when there are failures within their group, so they're not accountable for their group. They are micromanagers, because only they can do it the right way. <coughs> and yeah, you'll find covert change killers, you gotta get them out of there. They're not hard to spot and they will take down everything you're doing. I, I've run into two. In one case, one of my boss said, no, Bob knows how to get the information out of the system. Yeah. And Bob's been here for a bazillion years. Bob was the biggest, he, just the biggest blocker to change and would obstruct everything, but I had to keep him because my boss wouldn't let me fire him until my boss got fired and then we got rid of Bob. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't Bob's fault he got fired. I mean, Bob was a good guy. Bob was a CFO that let it go to his head. I'm the CFO. He was really more like a finance director. And you couldn't tell Bob anything. And so he would tear down everything. And then there are the termites. Termites are the people that the longer they're there, the more damage they do. They are the ones who They've been there for 25 years. Everyone likes them, they're good guys, but they haven't changed anything. They don't wanna change anything. I had a guy that I had, was a termite. We had not raised the prices in our cafeteria. I ran food service among other things. Or the vending machines, I should say. We hadn't changed prices in 10 years. So I said, I wanna change the prices. He fought that left, right, up and down, went to my boss, Suggested we hold a survey of the employees to see what they think. I, I'm sure they're going to say, yeah, candy bars have been underpriced for 10 years. We re I take them up a quarter. <coughs> well, nothing was going to happen. But he was a termite. Great, he was a good guy, knew his stuff, but there was no change going to happen with him. So if you want the status quo, you kept him. He left you. The last guy is one that can sometimes be categorized <coughs> into this group. And we call them disruptors. They may have the behaviors of an underperformer or a covert change killer, but these are the people that you've got to identify and hold on to because they, they aren't happy with the mundane, the routine. They you know, aren't challenged by doing the same thing all the time. They are the ones that think out of the box. They're the ones that will take you to the next level. Now you can't have, I mean, if you're an IT company, I suppose you've got a whole company full of disruptors. Most of our you know, organizations couldn't tolerate it. I had this happen to me where yeah, I was working for S.C. Johnson. The owner of the company said, I want the fifth generation came into the business. And she said, I want you to be my controller, CFO. I had worked for him at the family office, so it made sense. And I said, sure, I'll be happy to do it. I, the CFO was telling me this. Yeah, I'll, I'm happy to do that. I like her. It's a good thing. Said, but I need another person because this family member is a little green, is going to take more of my time. I need another person in the finance department. Problem was, there was a hiring freeze on. So for me to ask for more people, it would have looked like we were playing favoritism. You know, hey, Lee goes to work for Sally and gets staffing. But the CFO also knew I had him because I wouldn't take the job if I didn't get another person. So that was my deal with the devil. He says, okay, you got your next person, you get Jeff. And I went, Jeff. Jeff is a freaking political time bomb. He you know, is the classic, what I said, disruptor. Nothing simple, nothing mundane. 
was where he wanted to play. And you didn't know what he was going to say, who he was going to say it to, how he was going to say it. But, what I, so, but I took him, because I had no choice at that point. But I did my best work with Jeff. Yeah, he was a handful. And I had to coach him more on what to do or not do when we go into meetings. But we did some of our best work when Jeff was there challenging us to think outside the box. Just being himself took everything we did to the next level. And I know this was 15 years ago, and I know they're still using some of the models that we developed on how to predict share. They're using those today, globally. And it was largely because Jeff kept kind of pushing. So disruptors are a good, good thing. You just, they will look like one of the other three perhaps though. More likely the covert change killer or the underperformer. So sticking with underperformers is something you want to avoid. Having too many initiatives going on, I forget where I read it. You, know, you can only tackle three to five strategic initiatives as an organization at a time. How many of you have more than five initiatives at your firms? Yeah. We all, we've all fallen victim to that. This week? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, and how many times do you walk in? We're doing too many things. We're stretched too thin. We're drowning in routine tasks, and yet they just continue. You know, so you got to focus. You got to pick a few things that are really important, and then stick with them. And not like you said, not this week we got five. You know, no, there. I, I was just talking to uh, the CIO for the state of Illinois. He, he actually really interesting guy. Had run Cisco's Internet of Everything or Internet of Things globally, and then was kind of enticed by Governor Rauner to sit on his cabinet as CIO. This conversation was like two weeks ago. And he said, you know what we do? We break it down into 75-day plans or goals. I've heard of quarterly goals. I know of annual goals. I said, 75 days. He says, well, think about it. If you can be ready to be president between November 7th and January 22nd, which is what, 75, 77 days, you can certainly figure out just about anything else. So he breaks everything down into a series of 75 day plans. Which I think is pretty good. I mean, it's hard to push back against it, you know, and he's been very successful in the state of Illinois doing that. So focus on a few things. The next one, you know, doing it all yourself. This, this one, I wrote a blog post on this, uh, you know, five scariest words a, a leader can say. I can do that myself. And that's either because they don't trust their staff, they don't know their staff, they don't think it'll be done right. That, those are all different problems you've got. Doing it all yourself doesn't help your staff, it doesn't help the company, the firm, it doesn't help your client. You know, you, you got to learn how to delegate. You've got to be comfortable with it. And for those of you that are coaches, this model may look familiar. I mean, delegation is all about three things. How good a decision do you need to make? How much commitment do you need from those that are going to be affected by it? And how quickly do you have to make it? And if you need a high quality decision, you're going to want to involve some others in making it, you know, to make sure that You've got all constituencies heard from. You hear all different points of view. You're an inclusive problem solver. If you need a broad range of support for it, you're going to want to increase you know, who you bounce it off of, who maybe has input into it. It isn't just your direct reports. You go down one level, the next level. So subordinate commitment is important. And the more time you have, you have more luxury to get other opinions. So it's all about delegation. There's a, there's a whole model, like if anyone wants it, it was too small, kind of a tree diagram that shows on five decision, uh, five or six decision types, how to make those decisions. Is it you, should you bring in others? And it all balances these three uh, things. If you just shoot me your email, give me a card, I'll send you that two pager. But you gotta get comfortable with delegation. Doing it all yourself will kill you and you won't do it all well. The key here, 
What's the common theme? Involve others. Just don't sit in your office and think you got all the monopoly on all the good ideas. We go back to one of the first things we said. What do you think? Simple question. But it can save you so much heartache. So getting comfortable with delegation means you gotta get others involved in decisions. Yeah, more. Have they, um, when, you, when you've interviewed these CEOs, have they talked about involving others from a diversity standpoint and how different people think in different ways, females to, uh, you know, obviously the generation? You know, they didn't say it explicitly, but when we would talk about some decisions, they were doing that. They, they knew they couldn't just be old white males making that decision. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, and their companies, if you look at them, are very diverse. So when they're drawing from a pool, yeah. they're gonna naturally draw diverse opinions. Uh, what they seem to do well is talk to a lot of experienced people and inexperienced people. People that will ask the dumb questions right. that aren't dumb, but will ask, why do we do it that way? And so I saw more diversity in experience than maybe gender, race, yeah. religion. Yeah. You know, it, it probably depends on the question, the decision. Sure. Um, but involve others. That's a key lesson that we took away from all this. Sticking with the familiar. It's pretty easy if you were somewhere and were successful to now say, oh, I'm just going to take that and do it here. So let's look at four companies that tried that, that were blind to innovation or novelty. It's really what we're talking about. Blockbuster. It doesn't exist anymore. What did they, what did they miss? The internet. <laughs> Netflix. Yeah, mail order, streaming. They, totally, you know, they thought having brick and mortar stores with videotapes, that was gonna win the day. What about Xerox? But they not see. They're still around, but probably much smaller than they could have been. Well, they they invented the GUI and the mouse and thought it was a loser. <laughs> the mouse, laser printing, Windows icon, yeah, GUI, and personal photocopy. Totally, they, they licensed, sold it to Apple, I think. I know they stole it. Actually, they, they, they stole, stole it? it. Apple stole it, <laughs> and then Apple sued, what was it, Microsoft for stealing apples, and the court decision was, you can't sue on something that you stole. It was a great, it was a great decision. Yeah, and they and they got that because they just ignored it. They didn't think it was worth anything. They didn't think right. it was worth anything. They thought it was worthless. Yeah, Xerox did. So they owned all that. Kodak and Polaroid. This one, easy, maybe. <laughs> Digital photography. Totally missed it. Polaroid, I guess, is coming back. Kodak Kodak's. invented digital photography. Did you know? Yeah, that? They, they, invented they invented it, it and, the, and they, they presented it and said, Psh. They said insane. Don't say anything about that. Tech. I mean, it's I quoted in the book or that story in the book. They were afraid about killing their own business, yep. which was the, the prints. Yep. What, one of my You're favorite, absolutely right. One of my favorite stats was the Rand Group said, cellular phones, there'll be only 600,000 customers using cell phones by the year 2000. They were off by about a hundred million users. <laughs> it's like the Cubs. Everyone can have a bad century. <laughs> Digital photography. How about Hostess? <laughs> Absolutely right. They were, you know, they missed healthier food options. You know, they were off making Twinkies and Ding Dongs. <laughs> and went bankrupt and then came back. But they missed the healthier food options. But they did bring back the Twinkie. That's right. By popular demand. Yeah. <laughs> With an expiration date that's like, you should live so long. And no ingredients found on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> but so it's really easy to get enamored with your own business model or a business model that works somewhere else and trying to, um, you, you, you got to keep your eyes open. You got to stay relevant. It goes back to that question of what do you think involving others? And not just others within your circle of friends. We won't go through this in the interest of time, but if you want, you know, I, I, there's a self-assessment we created called "How open are you to change?" And you just answer. I think it's like 15 questions, similar to the self-assessment you took on leadership. You'll get an answer right away. But if you just, this is the link to it. 
And if you do that, it's mobile friendly. You can do it on your tablet, on your That's in the book, Lee? No, that one is not. This actually comes from, as long as you opened it up. Uh, we've moved from the book to a workshop uh, focusing on uh, helping emerging leaders make a bigger impact sooner. And that's where we're really seeing our business going is teaching these things to emerging leaders. Because when I'm talking to the C-suite, as we were talking at breakfast a few of us, it's too easy for them, ah, I know that stuff. And when you talk to their direct reports, ah, I, I, I know all that. But when you talk to them about the emerging leaders, the people that are gonna take over the company, they go, yeah, they don't get it. They don't get it at all. Yeah. So we are finding a great greater demand to offer programs to emerging leaders and even new hires. We've got a workshop just for new hires that can be plugged into an onboarding program. Because they need to know this stuff sooner than later. You know, it's not like some secret club with a handshake to get in. Uh, knowing this when you're 25 is much more valuable than knowing it when you're 40. Because you don't make these mistakes. But just check out the, the, the self-assessment. And in our workshop, there's like seven or eight self-assessments like this. Lack of alignment is huge. And it all comes down to communication. It's easy to say, you gotta talk, you gotta talk often. It's so hard to do because there's so many demands on all of our time. But when you talk about communication, it's frequent. It, we were talking, um, this is a related, sort of related. Uh, client was an accounting firm, and they couldn't understand why no one was using their international services, tax services. And we started talking to them. I said, well, when did the tax practice begin? Well, it began two years ago. And you're not happy with the utilization now. Well, what have you done to promote it? Well, two years ago, we told all our clients we do international tax. They don't remember it. You gotta be more frequent in the communication. It's gotta be direct, jargon-free, candid. Accurate, um, transparent. You know, they don't want to know this. I worked with one client that we we were talking about a compensation plan, and it was a big change. And they said, he said, well, let's we won't tell the income partners about it. The equity partners will know, but I said, assume the income partners will find out. No, they won't. They won't. And so we didn't tell them. And of course they found out and there was hell to pay. Uh, so transparent is important. Consistent, don't be saying one thing to one group and something else to another group. And we've got plenty, I could make plenty of comparisons to the recent political campaigns. Be consistent. All of this probably applies to direct, transparent, balanced, share the good news and the bad news. Just don't go to your folks saying, we had a great quarter. And don't tell them about, you know, that you lost money because the margins were way down. Or how, how many of you do this? You're quick to shout about winning a new client. But how many of you tell others about when you lost a client? That's really hard to get professionals to do is admit that they lost a client. But you can learn from it. You learn more than from when you won a client. So it's got to be balanced, the good and the bad. Two-way, just don't have a dialogue. A monologue, make it a dialogue. Yeah. Well, one of the things I always come up against is that people are blaming other people. Sure. Oh. So I go in and I have a rule that you can blame somebody else for 60 days and that's it. Yeah. And it's got it. Then you own it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. Did everyone hear that? You can only blame people for 60 days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Including your spouse. Well. Yeah. I'm, I'm at fault even if I'm not there. I mean, I had nothing to do with it. I learned that. Uh, and then you want to use channels that are appropriate to that audience. I was interviewing a fellow by the name of Todd Brook, who runs uh, Evision, a, a, market, a digital marketing firm here in, in Chicago. And he thought he was doing a terrific job. He was following all this, frequent, direct, consistent, balanced. Thought he was doing a great job, but it was falling flat. 
because he figured out he was talking in terms that he wanted to be talked to, that he understood. Someone had come to him and told him that, that you know, this isn't working so well because of that. He changed his message based on talking to some of the people who were in the audience, or would be in his audience, and that changed everything. So he adapted his communications to be more in line with how they wanted to hear things, you know, the things they were most interested in, not just what Todd found interesting or the way he wanted to hear them. So alignment's all about communication. And you can't see it here. It's, I have a, one story. I was interviewing uh, Aaron Gillum, who is the managing director of a private equity fund in Chicago. And he told this story about a couch about alignment, and he was running this company that was, it was a turnaround situation. Terrible cash flow. Bank was about, you know, they were about to breach their covenants. The shareholders weren't going to invest any more money. <clears throat> and their sales weren't generating enough cash, free cash flow to keep funding the business. So he called all the employees together, maybe it was in the warehouse. Called them all together and told them the situation and what they could do to help. How even the warehouse person could be doing something, it wasn't just the CFO, to help the cash flow problem. He'd gone through this, and from what he told me, he did, he did a good job. But then one woman raised her hand and said, well, how bad is it? <laughs> and I just told you how bad it was. He said, well, tell you how bad it was. I, before coming to this meeting, I was in the lobby of the office, and the FedEx driver pulled up. And he was dropping off the day's packages. And he says, you know, Mr. Gillum, I'm here every day. Every day I come in here, I admire your couch. I love that couch. Aaron looked at him and said, would, would you like to own it? And the guy said, well, he said, I'll sell it to you for $600. The FedEx delivery driver wrote out a check, and Aaron and the driver loaded the couch onto the truck. And off it went. So Aaron says to the woman that asks, how bad is it? It's so bad I'm selling non-essential office furniture to raise cash. Now that didn't panic the people, but it made it really clear to them they, they had a problem and how simple things can help. And he got instant alignment by telling the couch story, which is one of my favorite stories that I love. You know, There goes the couch. Anyway. So you gotta have alignment. Lack of a winning strategy. I mean, that one's pretty clear. I mean, look at Marissa Myers. I, is she still with Yahoo? Or have they terminated her yet? But I mean, you can look other places. You can look at John Scully, who moves from Pepsi to, to Apple. You can look at, what's his name? Uh, was it Ron Johnson that moved from Apple or Target to Apple, you know, to Penny, Pennies. And you know, what worked, at one, they all thought would work somewhere else, and they just kind of put that strategy in, and they've all failed. Now, I, Marissa Meyer, I don't know. If she isn't fired yet, she will be. I mean, she hasn't turned that company around. It's not just a lack of a winning strategy, but coming up with a winning strategy quickly. And the last one is overpromising. That one's really hard to recover from, because if you're the new kid on the block, you're prone to want to say, I can run faster, jump higher, do more in less time, and that's hard to recover from. No one trusts you after that when you fail. Um, I, would, I told you earlier, I was with a group of uh, startup CEOs, and the one guy was telling a story about this, which I said, told him I was going to steal. He runs something called uh, Food Junkie. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. It's an aggregator of restaurant menus, and you type in, you know, you, you get the menu, you see what you want. It's not like Grubhub. It, it, you order from a specific restaurant. And uh, he said, you know, we were really good. Our orders came in mostly from 8 to 5, Monday to Friday. <laughs> but on the off hours, we told you, we were 24-7. But 24-7 meant I was at home with the cell phone, sleeping with it by my head, because apparently the back end of this product wasn't totally developed yet, and he was having to transmit the orders to the restaurants that people chose. And he said, we get most of our orders, I said, from 8 to 5, Monday to Friday, so it's a Saturday, things are slower than normal, 
He says, I decide to go to a movie, you know, at like five, six o'clock. And the movie theater's in my building. So I didn't have to go very far, but I went to the movies. While I was gone, he gets a call, or after he gets, he gets a message. Someone had gone, had placed an order, had gone to the restaurant to pick it up, and the order hadn't been transmitted by him to the restaurant. Now that's bad in itself, but then he found out that the person who picked up, was ordering the food, was the Fox News anchor in Chicago. <laughs> really bad, you know. And, you know, the way he, it's not just about, you know, avoiding overpromising, but what do you do when that happens? And in his case, they immediately stopped promising 24 7, seven days a week. You know, we are only taking orders from 8 till 5, Monday to Friday, until he got the rest of the system up. Um, you know, you don't need to overpromise, it, it's only going to come back. To bite you. I had an experience, we were selling hand stamps, pre-ink hand stamps, the draft and paid. Now this is in the early 90s, and we were, there wasn't a way that you could transcribe the orders, or they couldn't automatically enter a typesetting program. We literally took the orders in by fax, typed them into our typesetting system, and we were doing $60 million a year in hand stamps, $10 per stamp. We were the, the sole provider to, home, or to Office Depot. And we went out there and we were talking to them and we said, well, what do you, you know, we were just talking to their service people. Well, we promise 96 hour delivery for our customers, four days. Gee, why do you do that? We're busting our ass to get them back to you. We promised you 24 hours. And we weren't, we were doing that, you know, 90% of the time. But we were over-promising, the client, the customer, Office Depot knew it, and here we were busting our butts trying to get these hand stamps out in 24 hours. We changed our policy almost immediately to 72 hours. We didn't lose a single customer. We were still doing better than Office Depot expected. They were still able to beat the expectations of their customers, but we found we were over-promising and as a result, killing ourselves in a process. But until we, back to the lesson of, you gotta ask somebody something. Just to interrupt real quick. Um, the break will occur at 11.15, so you got 15 more minutes. Right on. We'll, we'll come back at 11.30, and then we'll get, back on, we'll get back on the schedule track for lunch at 12.15, so everybody planning their schedules. So keep going. Okay. Yep, no, I'm right within the time. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Andy. Lee, you know, in light of the old, Factors, yeah. US, can you explain a little bit about how we very often see a high pro profile CEO be fired and next job he does he gets better terms and better salaries than he did the one that he was fired from for one of these things? No. <laughs> no, I can't I can't explain why that I mean I can explain why they get fired. Yeah, but I'm I can't explain why they get rehired when they haven't learned I mean, okay, I, was just, I, I don't, I, you know, I, my interviews were not about, tell me about your failures, uh, and they've all had failures, sure. but I didn't go after that because I didn't think I could get anyone to talk to. Uh, so we only talk their successes maybe in the next book. That would be a really good question, but I don't know the answer other than, like you, I have anecdotal evidence, but nothing that I can put. Well, it's good that you're doing it in the second book, because if you've done it in the first, they wouldn't talk to you. True. <laughs> <laughs> the third book is called, the third book title is You Can't Make This Shit Up. I mean, it's not in here. That's the, that's the third book. Uh, that one will get me on the Today Show. Uh, but anyway, those are the nine behaviors. Those of you that took the self-assessment, we already sent you back, which of the nine behaviors you know, you may have to be alert to, and we'll talk a little more about that. But here's a, what I'd love you, for you to do, if you don't mind, is take out your cell phone, and let's see which of the nine behaviors, just pick one, that you fall victim to the most often. And we'll do a real-time poll. All you gotta do is, you wanna text to 22333, the letters E-L-W-C, so the two is 
two, two, three, three, three. The text is the LWC, and then they'll say, okay, you're in the LWC. Then pick A through I, just one letter, and we will see which one of these you all have fallen victim to the most often. So real time, eight of you were able to text. <laughs> <laughs> That's two the real you, commentary. <laughs> so you attempt to do too much, and you're not being open to innovation, and you can see how the, the distribution OK, is. so it didn't work. <laughs> Let's see what this does. No. What up? There we go. <laughs> Overpromised. Yeah, I think you so just need to do, you can eliminate the ELWC and just text 22333. Three, three, three. Oh. And then your letter. Okay. Yep. Try that. I, I will say, as president, that is what I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're president. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you get the idea. You can see where you all are <laughs> grouping up, and we'll show okay, you. So my, my, my not being work. open to innovation, that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> well, but I'm not surprised. I mean, it's only two people. I mean, how can I judge out of nine, two? But attorneys, accountants, are used to being the experts in the room. You're used to having the answers. Mm -hmm. And that challenge to that expertise, you know, you see it a certain way, and, you know, you got a fact pattern that fits. So that wouldn't surprise me. And this one, too, oh, I don't trust anyone else to do it. I'm the only one that knows how to do this. I also get measured on bill of hours, so I'm going to do a lot more. But just to show you, out of 160 respondents, uh, what they thought, where they come up, 75% of the people said they hold on to underperformers too long. They have this problem. And you can have multiple ones that you're dealing with. 55%, number two, too many strategic initiatives. And the third, most popular of 160 people, is lack of alignment. And on average, and those of you that took the self assessment, you got that red flag report that had the red flags across the top. The average number of red flags is 2.8 on this sample of 160. And you can see where the others are. Coming in with the answer doesn't seem to be as big of a problem as some of the others. Um, one caution, I think maybe Brett and I were talking about this. The problem with, or maybe it was Jim, problem with self-assessments is it's what you think of you. Um, that's nice, that's important. <laughs> but I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in it. I go back to, what do you think? So we offer, and I'm not doing this as a sale, but we offer a 360. What you want to do is ask others, how am I doing on these things? Am I a good listener? You know, you may think you're fantastic, but your direct reports may say, how? And I've had this challenge, so I'll get this out of the way. Well, that, there's a bias there. You know, these self-assessments are biased. Well, of course they are. But, you know, okay. The other challenge I've had is, is our 360 assessment a standardized, validated assessment? No, it isn't. And for the researchers in the room, you know what I mean by validated. I mean, I can't be predictive of behavior. My argument is, and I've worked with two or three, three PhDs on it, it's not validated. But if 20 people say you're not a good listener, you're not a good listener. I don't need to have surveyed 10,000 people. Particularly if they're, they're the ones you're supposed to be listening to. Yeah. Direct reports, internal colleagues, external colleagues, your boss. That's what a 360 assessment looks like. But just to show you, you know, give you some feel for it. So, you, like I said, about half of you took the self assessment <laughs> that we offered. And for those that didn't, this is the link to it. It's on page 126 of the book. It's the link it takes you five minutes, there's no charge, you get three reports back. And I will show you how this group did of the 11 that took it that I was able to score before doing the presentation. You get this report back, number one, and it says we break down the 26 attributes into four categories. Astute generalist, all-star relationship builder, champion of the culture and competitive advantage, and courageous decision maker. And you'll see how you score on each of the four and then you get a total score. Is that clear how that? Would you report how that works? 
And these were the four general categories we identified when we talked to the 30 CEOs. This group scored, on average, 82.1 was the total score. AFI, 82.1. The average of all 160 that we have in our sample you know, it's very close, 81.3. And you can see how you all score here in the blue as a group relative to the others. The toughest one that we always find as a group is the courageous decision maker. And anecdotal evidence when we talk to people is people want to be liked. You know, it's, this is about drawing a line in the sand and sticking with it. This is about being an inclusive decision maker. This is about um, yeah, those would be the big ones. Ooh. There's seven, seven, seven items in there. Um, inclusive problem solver. I keep an open mind. That doesn't mean you're a flip flopper, but you're you don't lock in on decisions right away. Uh, you're effective at holding a, people accountable for their commitments. So that's what effective decision making makes. But, this one's always the toughest, and you guys don't seem to have, as a group, that individual problems. And your scores are still high. I mean, so how, how much, the, what's the delta between the self-assessment and the 360 that you run into? It varies, I mean, I don't have enough data in. I mean, this is a relatively new tool. The ones that we've done, we will regularly see two to three point differences. So you may think you're a five, and your direct reports say you're a three. But that would throw that, really skew that out then. Oh yeah, to this is just it. the self-assessment. Yeah, right. I this agree. is just how you view yourselves. Uh -huh. I'll be curious to see how your people view you. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was asking. Yeah, yeah and I know. The two. I just yeah. don't have enough data yeah. to answer that question definitively. Again, you're seeing, mm -hmm. we published the book in May. We've been yeah. doing self-assessment. You know, to show you 20, you know, 360s just isn't going to mean much. But if you all sign up for 360s. Anyway. You, you could probably get a, a business school to do that test before you get some samples Yeah. on this. You know, not have to do it on, on assignments, but as a class project to a number of different settings. That's not bad. I live right at the edge of the Northwestern campus. I go over to the B school where they have, I want people that have had people experience, have had some ex experience. Yeah. You know, managing others to be able to do this. That's not a bad idea. Might be interesting to compare family executives and non family executives. I, you know, the, the right now we're in the data collection mode. Mm -hmm. I totally once we get it, yeah. I think it's a we're gonna have a rich database from which we can draw conclusions. But again, we're just at the early stages. You also got this report which is the red flag report, so it has this, the nine behaviors across the top, and based on your answers to the 26 attributes, which of these nine behaviors do you have to possibly be on alert for? And in this group, you know, I showed you this chart before. And this is AFI. Number one, holding on to underperformers too long, same as the 160. Number two, too many strategic initiatives, which is the number two there as well. <coughs> And then it's a tie, lack of alignment, doing it all yourself. Uh, <coughs> you know, so it, I'd say it's consistent with what the overall trends are. But again, this is just a group of 11. Um, so it really looks like this one. I guess we're going to end up doing a whole seminar on that for, as part of our workshop. And we have that built. Uh, just to wrap, you know, I wrap it up, I mean, there's a book that came out, What Really Works. I don't know if any of you have seen this. I didn't see this until after I was done, but the authors looked at 160 companies over 10 years, and they identified eight elements that directly correlated with superior corporate performance, and they defined that by total return to shareholders. Out of those 160 companies, they identified four primary elements that you needed and four secondary elements that you needed. If you wanted to be a winning company in terms of excellence, who was at the top of their list? And you needed all four primaries plus two yeah. of the four secondaries. And if you can see this, 
try this out. This was the list of 20 <coughs> elements that they gave to their sample. And said, pick the four primary. What four must you have <coughs> to be an excellent company, to have you know, outstanding you know, shareholder returns? And you, remember, you've got to have all four of these mm -hmm. in a winning company. So take a minute, just if you can read them. I know there's a lot there, maybe it's small. But pick four. What four do you think you need? Should I start? You want me to, you sure. Want to sure. I would pick 10, 11, 13, 15. 10, 11, 13, 15. Okay. 10, 11, 13, 15. Should we just go with Dan? Because I've got what the four are. Here are the four. Clearly communicated strategy, operational excellence, meeting customer expectation. Number 10. And number 12, <laughs> you know, an organization structure that, that works efficiently and effectively. So now, pick two more. So those are the four you need for sure, absolutely positively. Now what are the other two that the winning companies, they had to have two of the four secondary elements. So pick two. I think 11, definitely. 11? Laura said 15 and 17? Dan, you want to go for broke? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Jimmy, Jimmy wants Here to they go. are. Sure. 13, talent. That was one of mine. Yeah. 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 And 15. And 15. 15 was one of mine. A great well. leader. Yeah. Driving innovation. And this one, you know, I still don't get, but they said, you know, you need to be very good at developing uh, partnerships and strong merchants. You don't have to delight your, your customers? Obviously not. They're not saying it's not important, but if you do the other, you have to meet their demands in six. It's, right. Yeah, six is pretty meet their expectations. Yeah, you know, you got to do four of the first and at least two of the second if you wanted to have this winning company. What it what it came down to, and this it validated what we were doing. I mean, and I again, I saw this after we were all done. The four primary elements are culture, strategy, execution, and structure. And the bottom four, talent, leadership, innovation, mergers, and partnerships. So it kind of made me feel good when I said, well, I got seven out of the eight, and I can probably stretch into the eighth if I want to. Summing it up, this is all about knowing what to do, being aligned on what to do, and then doing what's got to be done. Um, so wrap up. Really, the point of my presentation was to encourage you to increase your self-awareness. Don't be afraid of it. Make, so that you make that impact faster and bigger than you expect. You're, pre you're prepared for what lies ahead. And when your leadership moment strikes, you seize it. And that's how you can reach me. And remember, so thanks. these slides we're, we're going to get on our website or already have? Uh, I sent them to Drew. Drew. Peter. They're, 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 they're on. They're Drew has done it. So Real-time stuff. So. Uh, and I finish. It's Lee, awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. We will re